Okay, we're recording. So, um, as I was mentioning, I'm, I'm Malahini to Hawaii. I moved here in 1997. Um, uh, truly blessed to be here uh, and, and just was incredibly blessed to find the right Kumu who, who uh, kind of pointed me in the right direction and, and, and nurtured me along the way. Um, I want to start by giving you a tiny bit of my mo'oko alhawa. I won't make it long. My mother is Janet Marie Labounty. I think she's here with us today. Um, and she comes from Chicago, Illinois, which is where I was born. My, her people come back from Montreal. Before that, Ireland, London, um, uh, France, uh, and places, places of Europe. My father is Ron Williams Sr., Big Ron. Um, my dad is uh, from Arkansas, which is where I grew up. A long line of farmers, fishermen, hunters, and so forth. Um, so that's my uh, familial mo'okuauhau. My academic mo'okuauhau, I went to college in 1984 to Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And that's the year we won the national championship in football, by the way. And um, I was there for a semester and a half, and I think I passed one class. Um, it was mutually agreed that I leave the campus, and I did. Um, I went back to school at 33 years old. Uh, I was working luau in Lahaina, Maui, and making good money and watching the sunset every night, eating moi and pohole French salad, uh, drinking beers. Uh, but I luckily fell under the, the gaze of uh, Akoni Akana, my first kumu. Akoni uh, took me under his wing, taught me a little bit about language, taught me about Maui, and got that fire started. I went to Maui Community College in 19, in 2001, my kumu there was Kiopi Raymond, another wonderful kumu. Uh, and in his class one day, I saw a film that changed my life. And that was a, a film of um, Dr. Hanani K. Trask. Um, and I said, that's who I want to study under. I was a bit naive, um, <laughs> and, and, but I bludgeoned ahead and did it anyway, and was incredibly blessed that she and everyone else at Kamakoku took me under their wing and got me through college without exaggerating. Uh, I went to Kamakoku in 2002, no, 2003. Mehana Hind was the reason I stayed there. She pulled me aside and said, if you come here, this is your home too. Uh, and I did, I, I was an undergrad there. I was a grad student there, a grad student teacher and eventually became faculty. Um, got my BA in Hawaiian studies in 2003, my MA in Pacific Island studies in 2008, and my PhD in history of Hawaii in 2013. So that's my mo'okuau hao. Um, I wanna say thank you to each and every one of you. We have 67 folks with us today. Uh, and for you to take time out of your Saturday, especially more time since I blundered the, the invite, um, I really do appreciate it. It really means a lot to me. Um, these opportunities to, sh to pass on the mo'olelo, because that's what I do, right? That's all, that's all I do is, is take these mo'olelo and give them back to the community where they belong. Um, and the opportunity to have an audience to do that too, I, I, I do appreciate and I'm humbled by it. So thank you. Um, today we're going to talk, as she mentioned, as Darcy mentioned, and I want to thank Darcy. Um, she's my program help and, and my program a partner. Um, everything that's gone wrong the last two or three weeks, I run to her and she fixes. So, uh, so that's Darcy. I thank her. Um, I wanted to, the, the, the purpose of this event today was that Navahi's birthday is coming up. Every year I do something with Lynette Cruz and uh, Kalei Miley Ali'i. Um, we usually do something uh, at the palace or so forth, but because of COVID this year, as you all know, it's changed things up. And I did, just didn't want Navahi's birthday to go by without doing something. I know they're going to do something wonderful, but I also wanted to do something and just reach out and say, does anybody else want to celebrate? Um, and so I'm happy that you all came. It's not going to be a biography of Navahi. There are others who know more about him. There are others who have more kuleana than I. Uh, I want to note the, the Meyer Ohana the, this, and other descendants of Joseph Navahi uh, who are with us. And also um, Te Kula Kaiapuni, O Navahi O Kalani Opu in Hilo. Uh, the kumu there, the students there, the principal there, those folks are going to take the story of Navahi to places we can only imagine right now. But what I wanted to do today is kind of really focus in on a particular part of his ano. And that was his patriotism. Um, I've often referred to him as in my mana'o, Iko mana'o, the greatest patriot in Hawaiian history. But that's not just my mana'o. That's the mana'o of those folks that he lived with. 
And so I'm gonna pinpoint and highlight some of those things and things people said about him and events why I consider him an incredible po'i aloha aina. In doing so, I'm gonna bring forth some primary source records that I thought would be, be, be uh, enriching to see. Um, instead of the old black and white or this, but, but, but scans of the, original, of, the, of the original documents, so that'll be hopefully add to the story. Um, and again, I wanna focus in and have us all think about as we go through this, what is a po'i aloha aina? Many different uh, interpretations and Patriot's one of them, but, but particularly for this talk, um, what is a Patriot? You know, we, I'm not gonna allude to anything that's going on in the news today or over the last few years. I'm gonna keep it in his realm and ask, because my idea of a Hawaiian kingdom Patriot has changed. Um, as the story of Hawaiian history gets explored and becomes more complicated and more understood, we see that Hawaiians are human, yeah? We see that Hawaiians did this and that and so forth. And, we're, and, and what it does often is reveal to us the extraordinary nature of some of the decisions they made. So having come through all that, I, I do come to see Navahi as an incredible po'eloha aina, okay? So let's get started. Um, I'm gonna open up my, my, my PowerPoint or my uh, keynote and share it with you guys as my screen. Uh, I'm gonna just talk from there on through through the screen. As Darcy said, please throw in questions that you have along the way. Um, at the end, we'll answer all the questions we can. Um, if you have a question about him in particular, about history of that period or something I said, um, I'll do my best to answer it. Um, so, so as we go along, please do add questions. For me, it's the fa my favorite part because it lets me know what you guys are interested in and what, what part of that mo'olelo kind of touched you, okay? So um, you see my scan in the back here um, with fresh lay. I wanna mention that because at the end, I'm going to um, give you a uh, note about thinking for ourselves what our kuleana is moving forward. And I wanna offer you resources for those who wanna take this mo'olelo and run with it. Um, and one of those resources is the Hawaii State Archives. We have glass plate negative of Joseph Navahi. It's 140 years old and it's embedded in glass, which means it doesn't degrade. You can, we've, we've that, the scan you see behind you is, is, you know, pretty big and it's crystal clear and that's at 600 DPI. We can scan them at 2400 DPI. So my point is you have the opportunity to do what you'd like with this, uh, these Mo'olelo uh, and start claiming space on the historical narrative um, yourself, yeah? Okay, so let's get started without further ado. I'm going to, uh, so, oh, yes, notes about recording. <laughs> um, I wanna be careful about how I say this because I, because I, because I, wanna, I want it understood, I wanna be clear. Um, we are gonna record this event, Darcy and I, and we are going to post it publicly. Um, I don't always do that. And, I'm, and I don't always do that for a number of reasons that would take up way too much time here to explain, including the fact that some of the mo'olelo I get, some of the pieces I get come from folks, kupuna, others who have given me permission to use them in certain ways. Some of them come because I don't write a script for my talks, I talk story. And in my position, uh, you, know, I, I, I be, you know, I have to sometimes worry about talking for an hour and, and having it come back. But, but nonetheless, anyone who knows me knows that you know, I put my research out there and I want people to take it and run with it. That's the purpose of meeting today. So um, you're welcome to, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this. What, this long story short, I just ask that if you do want to record something of me or anyone else, it's just, it's nice to ask first. Um, I've gotten several notes that people have recorded stuff of my past talks and so forth um, and told me later. And I just think, maybe I'm old fashioned, I just think uh, if you're going to record, um, just ask permission. As, I know it's late for this one, as I mentioned, for this one we are recording and it will be posted publicly, okay? So that's that. Um, okay, so let's get into it. So, okay, there we go. Okay, in celebration of the birth and life, of Iosepa Ho'oluhi Navahi Okalani Opu'u. Now can I, I wonder, if I do that, you see it like that, right? You don't see it whole screen. It's not showing. Okay, yeah, because I don't, I just, I want to see somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but too bad. Okay, so yes, I'll note that also is that this is not my 
favorite forum. Um, I'm used to seeing faces and talking to people and seeing their reaction and getting energy from that. Uh, I'm a very poor presenter in this, in this realm, so Kalamai and, and please bear with me, okay? So, in celebration of the birth and life of Iosepa Kaho'oluhi Navahio Kalanio Pu'u, Ho'e Aloha Aina Oye Eo, a true patriot, okay? This um, quote from the bottom comes from the biography done by Sheldon of him, and it says, urge the new students of his beloved race and nation to follow behind him and read and understand the deeds which he accomplished and to model themselves after him, yeah? So it's this idea of looking to Navahi as a model for our Haumana, yeah? Okay. I want to start off, you know, I always talk about historiography when I talk, and, and, and it's crucial for me. And, and, and I know folks, some of you have seen this before many times, but it, if there's one person out there who hasn't, I want them to see it because the process of the creation of history, that's what historiography is. It's the process of the creation of history in Hawaii has been incredibly distorted. It's distorted in many places, but in Hawaii, it was purposely altered and manipulated and given to folks over a century in a way that elided native voice and hid native progress. So what we've come to today is a point where we're starting, you know, over the last 20 or 30 years, Kumu long before I and myself and others now and students now are starting to understand better what the Hawaiian kingdom was. And what I can say as a historian, you know, with, without qualm is the Hawaiian kingdom 1843 to 1893 was one of the most progressive modern nations on earth, and it was respected as such. That's so much different than the narrative that I got when I, when I arrived here, that the narrative that, I was, that, that my students got you know, before they came to Kamakaku, and even what we were teaching 10 years ago. So understand, that needs to be our starting point. The nation that Navahi was a leader of was a progressive modern nation. So I've developed these 10 talking points um, to show people why we can say that. Okay, so I'll walk through those with you. Yes. Um, you you got to share your screen. Oh, shoot. I thought I did. Ekalamai. Okay. Ekalamai. I had it on, but it went off. Okay. There you now, go. Okay, now I need to go full screen, right? Yes. Okay. Thanks again, Darcy. So, uh, 1840, Mo'i Kawikioli voluntarily cedes absolute rule for the benefit of his people and nation. Now, as a historian, I don't know another instance of an absolute ruler. Think about this. Kawikioli was divine. If you want to talk about ownership, he owned everything. If he wanted something done, it was done. If he wanted something, it was his. And yet he gave up two-thirds of that power. He created a constitutional monarchy that had three branches of power. Now, it wasn't completely separated from him yet. It would be in, over the next 10 or 15 years. But nonetheless, he gives up a huge chunk of his power for the purpose of gaining recognition to save the independence of his nation. He was prescient and brilliant. European nations were taking over the Pacific right and left, and he knew Hawaii was next, no question. There's no question in my mind, had he not done what he did, Hawaii would have been occupied by the 1850s, maybe 60s. But, he's, but he voluntarily gives up two-thirds of, of his power to create a nation he's hoping will gain recognition from the world and be protected, 1840. 1840, that constitutional monarchy he, cre he creates has a female Supreme Court justice member in 1840. That's 141 years prior to the first U.S. Supreme Court female justice, Sandra Day O'Connor, yeah? 140 years prior to this breakthrough in the United States, the Hawaiian Kingdom had a female Supreme Court justice, yeah? 1843, and, and also Hawaiian governors of the islands, Hawaiian noble women, and so forth, in the 1840s and 50s, long before they became so, so forth in the United States. 1843, that Hawaiian kingdom becomes the first nation in the Pacific and the first non-European born nation in the world to achieve international recognition as a sovereign and independent nation. We're hearing that story more and more because of La Kuokoa and so forth, but think about that. How many Haumana in Tennessee know that fact? That Hawaii was the first non-European born nation in the world to achieve recognition and co-equal status 
with France and England and Ireland and Russia and Spain and so forth. 1843. 1852, Mo'ikawiki Oli and the Kingdom Legislature declare universal manhood suffrage, regardless of race, to the nation as part of the Kumu Kanavai of 1852. So in 1852, a decade prior to a war in the United States, which would take 600,000 lives, Americans killing each other over whether or not to own black people. A decade earlier, those same people and every other race in the planet could come to Hawaii, become a citizen, own property, and vote. A decade before the Civil War. That's a progressive modern nation run by Kanaka Oivi. 1854, Maui Kaukioli declares Hawaiian Kingdom neutrality in the ongoing Crimean War, setting precedent for international laws of neutrality. Dr. Sai uh, uh, brought this to my attention and others' attention. In 1854, Kaukioli says, I'm not taking part. Your warships are coming into our harbor. We're not, we're not, we're neutral. And that forced Europe to come to a meeting in Europe and develop the laws of neutrality around the world because of the Hawaiian Kingdom stance. 1860s, Oko Alpuni Haupuni Palapalako. My name, my kingdom shall be a country of literacy, a kingdom of literacy. By the 1860s, the Hawaiian Kingdom was one of the most literate nations in the world with near universal literacy, well ahead of the United States in literacy. Almost every Hawaiian read and wrote by the 1860s, three decades, four decades after the arrival of literacy at all. Yeah, that's a progressive modern nation. 1874, Moi Kalakaua was the first head of state to, to appear before a joint session of the US Congress. Does, does everyone know that? The first head of state to, do, to, to appear before a joint session of the US Congress was Kalakaua. The first state dinner, the first formal state dinner given at the White House was Ulysses S. Grant for King David Kalakaua of Hawaii. The first honoree of the, yeah, the first White House dinner. So these things are, are again, nods of what has happened because of the Hawaiian Kingdom. When I talk about diplomatic recognition, by the 1880s, Kalakaua was the first monarch to circumnavigate the globe. We had electricity at Ilani Palace prior to the White House. And he had proposed an Asian federation, a Polynesian and an Asian federation, that would come to, to be, if it happened, something like the EU. We have the EU formed a, a few years back, a couple of decades back, and it was this progressive modern idea. Kalakaua had that idea 100 years ago. Hey, Europeans are taking over the Pacific. They're pushing, they're, they're doing these things. Why don't we band in Oceania or in uh, Asia and, and have a common currency? and lower trade barriers and so forth among each other so we can push back against this rise of white power in the Pacific. Yeah, prescient. And Kalakaua, while Kawikioli started it, Kalakaua took it to another level as far as diplomatic diplomacy, opened up consulates and, and, and uh, embassies around the world. Uh, I put together a, a, a complete list which hadn't been done before. I published it in the Hawaiian Journal of History last year, but we found out that in 1887, the Hawaiian Kingdom maintained over 136 consulates and embassies on six continents across the globe. 136 Hawaiian Kingdom consulates and embassies around the world. And those weren't just for show. The consulate in Port Townsend, uh, Seattle, for, for, another, for, for, for an example. Hawaiian sailors had gotten off a ship, whaling ship, in Seattle, and their captain refused to pay them. Bunch of brown guys, it's a white country, what are they gonna do? They went to the Hawaiian Kingdom Consulate in Port Townsend, filed a complaint. The Hawaiian Kingdom Consulate there filed a complaint with the territory of Washington's Supreme Court and they won their pay, right? These were ways of taking care of Hawaiian Kingdom citizens around the globe. 136 consulates on every continent, except for Antarctica. 1890, Hui Kalai Aina proposes women's suffrage as an amendment to the Constitution. The first nation in the world to achieve women's suffrage was Aotearoa in 1893. But even prior to that, Hui Kalai Aina proposed changes to the Bayonet Constitution in 1890, and one of them was women's suffrage. 31 years before women would gain suffrage under the United States in 1921. So again, evidence of a progressive modern nation. Take these 10 talking points, teach them to the people you know. Okay? I'm going to throw up a thing here, the late sun is hitting me in the face. So give me one second, I'm gonna throw this up. 
Okay, come back. So that's the nation that Navahi was part of, that he was a leader of. When I talk about historiography in Hawaii, I, I, yeah, I could go for hours, and, um, but I think one of the main points to remember is the narrative of Hawaii that we received, about 95% of it, to this day, about 95% of the books written about Hawaii and Hawaiians come from exclusively English language sources. There's a lot of people doing a lot of great work and, and, and it's changing, but if you go to the library today and you pull out 100 books on Hawaii, 95 of them are gonna, say, are gonna use just English language sources. Why is that a problem? Because the kingdom, there were people who spoke Hawaiian and Chinese and Japanese and so forth. And we're learning from a micro group of people. Include, we're talking about around 4,000 people in a nation of 110,000. Um, Helen Chapin calls it the 6%. That's who wrote Hawaiian history. The missionaries, the missionary wives, the, the ship captains, the businessmen and so forth and they excluded native Hawaiian voice. Now, for a long time, that was not even thought of as an issue. In the 60s and 70s, Sam Kumu started to push the issue. And folks like, I hate to call, well, I was gonna say I hate to call him out, but I don't. Um, Gavin Dawes wrote the most prolific history of Hawaii published and sold. And in the 1960s, and you could, you know, maybe, you know, he didn't know and so forth, but, but when questioned about this, about 15 years ago about why he hadn't included Hawaiian language sources, Mr. Dawes said that Hawaiians weren't in the habit of speaking about themselves and those sources are rare. Not true. We have 125,000 pages of Hawaiian language newspaper, hundreds of thousands of Hawaiian language correspondence, legal documents, records, and so forth. A prolific voice from Hawaiians about their land, their lahui, their lives, but we just never listened to it. That's all changing. These folks are some of the folks we, that we got our history from, and I'll tell you who they are quickly. On the far left, I don't know if it's the same for you guys, uh, we have W.D. Alexander, William DeWitt Alexander. He wrote a book called, the, called A Brief History of the Hawaiian People, which became the history textbook for all schools in the territory of Hawaii for 40 years. And that book said, for, for, uh, among a number of other racist things, that two thirds of native Hawaiians killed their children in infancy because they were too lazy to raise kids. Under a chapter on infanticide, he said two thirds of native Hawaiian children were killed in infancy because of the laziness of their parents. That was what every kid in the territory of Hawaii read from 1900 to 1940. Next to him, you have Sereno Bishop. Sereno Edwards Bishop was a, mis was a, was a pastor I'd use in quotes because uh, he was off an awfully racist man who prolifically put out columns about Hawaiians under a pseudonym because he knew he was missionary and he shouldn't be doing this. Horrific columns about how Hawaiians weren't fit to run, run the country and so forth. And he wrote these in Washington, New York and, and East Coast papers under the pseudonym Kamehameha. He, says of the, he said himself of these Kamehameha letters in a letter to Gorham Gilman, I will probably be uh, sorry for these letters in the post existence, but hopefully they've done some good. So you have this missionary saying, I'm probably going to hell for this, but at least we took over the country. He is another, one of the most prolific writers on Hawaiian history uh, that is used you know, in secondary and, and tertiary sources today even. Next to him, you have Sanford Dole, enough said. Next to him, Lauren Thurston, both folks, prolific writers on history of their own making. On the far right, you have John Tyler Morgan. John Tyler Morgan was the head of the Organic Act Commission that created the territorial laws of Hawaii that basically created the territory of Hawaii. Now John Tyler Morgan was a senator from the southern part of the United States. He also happened to be the second grandmaster of the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama. A hagiographic history of the Ku Klux Klan from one of the wives that talks about how great the Ku Klux Klan is, writes prolifically about his role as Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama. He, he, he was the man who wrote the laws for the territory of Hawaii, the structure of the government in, in 1900. So that's where this history came from. That's where we found out about Hawaiians. That's where we get the narrative by the 1940s and 50s that Hawaiians aren't capable, that they're civil servants only, that they're lazy, they're not good in school. That's, you know, that's what comes out of that 
incredible nation that we had mentioned earlier because of this cover, yeah? Okay. The power of claiming space. So when we talk about Navahi, we're gonna talk about not just hearing and learning, but doing. Um, one of the things I will never forget about Dr. Trask, uh, I never planned on being a teacher, I promise you. I came to learn things about Hawaii. It was fascinating. And I wanted to learn Hawaiian, you know, about Hawaii. Uh, and I finished my bachelor's degree. I went home to Maui, um, went through a divorce, got custody of my daughter, and was done. I had $10 to my name. And Dr. Trask called me and said, you're coming back to school, grad school. And I said, no, I, I have no money. I have no nothing. She's, no, you're coming back. You don't get to learn and walk away. You learn and you have kuleana to teach. Um, so I take that to heart and I take this idea that even in forums like this, when we share these mo'olelo, then the, then the folks learning them have kuleana too. Um, and that kuleana is yours to define. I would never tell you what your kuleana is, but hopefully some, a way in which you see pushing on these narratives to other people. And, and one of the ways we've always done it, and I say we, I mean a lot of us, Lynette Cruz and, and a lot of other folks, is through the power of claiming space. Um, physical space and mental space. Uh, today, as we sit here, this coming year, Eva Elementary School in Eva, Oahu, will celebrate its 179th Abraham Lincoln Day. Abraham Lincoln Day. That's claiming space on the students' minds and on the physical landscape because of that statue of Abraham Lincoln. McKinley High School claims space on the physical and mental narrative by having that statue in front of their school. Okay, um, I want to bear with you for bear with me for a minute. I'm going to read something I never read. I think it's so boring and it talks, but I, as I said, I don't have a, a script and I would butcher this if I tried to remember it. It's a few paragraphs long. It's a piece on constructing that national narrative and claiming space that I wrote for the uh, Hulili Journal a, year, a few years back, and I want to share that with you now, so please bear with me. A national narrative was created for Hawaii that had its genesis in a need to dislodge a people from their unambiguous identity as Hawaiian nationals and have them view themselves as Americans. A coup d'etat on January 17, 1893, led by a group of mostly foreign businessmen, resulted in a declaration of provisional government in Hawaii. This minority group, led by an oligarchic executive council, had no intention of running the country themselves. Their self-declared aim was simply to hold power until terms of a union with the United States of America had been negotiated and agreed upon. Immediately following the coup, a flood of textual sources cascaded from the presses, launching a concerted effort to link Hawaii to the United States in people's minds and concurrently displace identities of Hawaiian nationality. From the missionary press, to newspapers created for the specific purpose of advocating union with the United States, pro-annexation voices sought to highlight American connections, interests, and influence in Hawaii. Within the country, educational texts commissioned by the Board of Education and produced by people such as uh, Alexander. I think we have Dolce de Leche. Can I have some vanilla and some Dolce de Leche? Sure. Carlo, Mike, um, Ron, you need to unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself, Ron. I just did. How long have I been muted? Oh, just for a sec. Oh, there okay. was talking, so I had to un I had to mute everybody. Oh, okay. Okay. So, sorry. Um, here we are. Okay. So, um, an annexation commissioner supported the narrative of Hawaii as an American place. International efforts to naturalize the idea were directed through the positioning of a sympathetic voice as the Associated Press Honolulu corresponded to foreign papers. This narrative would later expand to take monumental form as one US president or public icon after another, whether an image or name began to dot the Hawaiian Islands landscape. In 1907, Honolulu High School on Oahu was renamed President William McKinley High in memoriam to the former US leader. The next year, a US military base named after Lieutenant General John Schofield was established on nearly 18,000 acres of land in Wahiwa. The decades that followed saw the erection of Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, and Roosevelt schools on Hawaiian soil. All of these entities and many more claimed space 
both on the physical landscape and in the minds of a new generation of Hawaiian youth. These young Hawaiian descendants of a nearly 2,000, two millennium presence of, on lands birthed by their ancestor, Papahanaomoku, would now memorize U.S. state capitals and lists of American presidents. A patriotic national narrative would be demanded during world, two world wars and later be powerfully amplified through the creation of a sobering U.S. war memorial at Pearl Harbor. Today, custodians of the memorial for the U.S. National Park Service offer a call of millions of visitors from the United States continent to travel to Pu'uloa, Oahu to experience your America. That's the, that's the quote they use. So claiming space on the physical landscape in the minds of students. Think about how many times you're driving down the street and you look around you, what tells you this is Hawaii? Lots of places and things will tell you this is the United States, okay? So power claiming space. So moving on to our, our main character within this narrative is Joseph Navahi. Now, I wanna pick out three things we could, I could, you know, I and others could talk about Navahi for hours. I want to talk about today his patriotism and what shows that to me. So there's three incidents I want to focus on. His service to the nation in the 1873 legislature, his service to the nation in the 1892 legislature, and his service to the nation post the 1893 coup. Okay, so I'll walk through those uh, incidents with you. I want to start by going through a little bit of his life um, narrative. I, as I said, this isn't a bio, but uh, I thought some of these documents would be interesting for folks. This is his trip to San Francisco. Uh, so Joseph Nava, he went to San Francisco where he enjoyed uh, Woodward Gardens. He went to, uh, on a hot air balloon. Um, he really, really, you know, took in the sights and, and gathered, you know, another nation's, you know, uh, knowledge. Um, the Honorable Joseph Nava, he lately residing in Honolulu in the Hawaiian Islands to pass out of the ports thereof of his destination to San Francisco or elsewhere. So this is his actual um, Hawaiian Kingdom passport. You needed a passport to leave the Hawaiian Kingdom and they would issue them. The government kept one copy, which is this one here that we have at the State Archives. And then you'd get a sealed a copy with a sealed stamp on it. Uh, and that would be your passport to travel around the world. One of the things to, to think about is in the 1860s and 70s when Mission and Mission Sons were traveling to the, Hawaiian, to, to the United States, they were Hawaiian Kingdom subjects. So they traveled with Hawaiian Kingdom passports. Now some of them would kind of skirt the law and also not say anything and go get an American passport. The idea of dual citizenship, people talk about a lot, but it was something that wasn't recognized, uh, isn't recognized, or what, I'm sorry, wasn't recognized by the United States at that time and into the 1890s. Lots of folks did it, but when something happened, the United States wouldn't back up folks who had taken an oath of allegiance to the kingdom. So, that, so this is Navahi's Hawaiian Kingdom passport. Okay, this is uh, in 1878, uh, Joseph Navahi goes before the courts, the Supreme Court of the Hawaiian Kingdom, and takes his law exam. Now he was a self-taught lawyer. Usually what you do, there were no law schools obviously, but usually what you would do is you train or study under a lawyer, usually a Hawaii lawyer. Um, and they would teach you and so forth. And you go through, through a few years of that, uh, and then you would, and you'd read all the law books, and then you'd take your exam. He, he didn't do that. He was self-taught. He studied the law books. And Albert Francis Judd, so this is his actual, uh, this is his oath uh, as part of his license that he took in 1878 to become a lawyer. Now, he, uh, Albert Francis Judd, who was the Supreme Court Justice for the Kingdom of Hawaii, um, wrote in his narrative, in his own words, that Navahi stood before the bench for up to an hour without missing a question. Yeah, that was his level of competence in the law. Yeah. Um, you'll see here his, uh, his marriage to uh, Aima, uh, IE. Um, one of the other things we have at the State Archives are the uh, vital statistics records. So we have birth, marriage, and death records. Some of the birth records, I mean, some of the marriage records back into the 1850s are official form records. Some of them are just lists made by the pastor saying, this is who I married. This is kind of a middle, uh, a, a middle road, one of those. And I wanted to share it with you. This is the actual marriage license of Navahi and uh, Joseph and, and Aima. I hereby certify that Joseph Navahi and Emma Aima Ai married by me on the 18th or 17th? Looks like 17th day of February AD, 1881. Uh, Reverend Lyman. 
yeah, signed by Luther Severance, who was the Minister of the Interior. So that's, you know, those are the, the type of, of materials, this type of palapala pala that we have uh, that reminds us uh, of the life of not only this great patriot, but his patriot wife. Okay, now to his, uh, his actions and his, the things that, that kind of reverberate for me as a true patriot. When we talk about patriot, I, I wanna, you know, I, I did this talk last year with uh, Aloha Aina folks and, and we were able to share that, you know, with each other, what, what our definitions were. Um, and one of the things that came out that I loved, and that's what kind of spurred this whole talk, was this idea of a patriot being loyal to his nation. Yeah, now that seems obvious, but one of the things that we have, have are working through, I think, in Hawaiian history is getting past, you know, these hagiographic hey ideas of everyone was absolutely a thousand percent devoted to the throne and the nation and so forth. There are lots of questions that come up often in my work about people ask me why I use the word loyalist or why I use the word royalist. A loyalist was somebody who was loyal to their nation. The Hawaiian kingdom was their top allegiance. Royalists are folks who were allegiant to the monarchy. Now you could be both. I, I, I believe Joseph Nava, he was both. He was absolutely devoted to his monarchy, but he wouldn't hesitate to question them respectfully in instances where he thought they had gone wrong if it benefited the nation. The Lahui was the ultimate thing to Joseph Navahi. You're gonna see some incidents in here that, that show that. And, and, and that's why it, it solidified for me as Joseph Navahi as a great patriot because he wasn't just adoring to the throne. He was adoring to the throne, but questioning when he thought the nation would benefit. And that takes courage. So, uh, service to the nation, 1873, Aho Lelo Kohova Ipai Aina. In 1873, the issue of the Treaty of Reciprocity came up. The, the rumors had started around Oahu and around the other islands. Rumors, the rumor mill in Hawaii was very good, very proficient. And rumors had started that the government was thinking of trading away Pearl Harbor to gain a sugar tariff taken off the, the sugar. Now, most of you know this, but, but to recap, sugar going into the United States was a foreign good, foreign countries, so it was taxed. If sugar growers who were already making millions could get that tariff removed and compete better on the US market, they would become even richer. So the idea was pushed to do this. Now this, there's a trickle down argument we, we know how the, well that worked with Reaganomics and so forth, but there was a trickle down argument that this would benefit the nation, the Lahui. But that's specious. This was basically a benefit to the sugar growers. Um, nonetheless, the idea, you know, there had been a secret mission of, uh, of, of General Schofield in the 1850s who had mapped out Pearl Harbor and the United States wanted Pearl Harbor. So the idea was floated, we'll trade you. You give us Pearl Harbor and we'll, we'll take off that tax. And in 1873, the monarch, William Charles Lulilo, was thinking about this idea. And the rumor had started that the government may do this. And so people were demanding an answer and the government wasn't coming forth with an answer. And the first official statement on this was this, or actually, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna back up a little bit, I'm sorry. There were meetings held throughout the islands fighting this idea. Joseph Navahi was a leader of those meetings, including Reverend G.W. Pilipo was also a leader of these meetings. Dozens and dozens of newspaper accounts of Halavai Maka'ainana around the islands, mass citizen meetings around the islands saying we do not give away land. And another thing that was about this supposed treaty was that America would be the only country able to access that area and so forth. And they would have ownership of that land, sovereignty over that land. So this would impinge on Hawaiian kingdom sovereignty. And so the people said, absolutely not. And they held these meetings. Navahi organized meetings, these meetings, along with Pilipo and others. And they said, no. Now, one gentleman, Charles Reed Bishop, wrote a letter, a private letter to, uh, to, to uh, officers back in the United States who was pushing this, I think. And he said, every Hawaiian leader in the islands is against this idea, even my wife. So 
people, the, the people came out, the nation came out and spoke what it wanted. This meeting, this um, meeting here talked about the exchange of the harbor at Pu'ulua for American reciprocity. Um, and in that meeting, they passed these res resolutions. Number one was they do not want this to happen because this is the first step towards annexation. Giving away Pearl Harbor is the first step towards annexation. And not only is Navahi pushing this idea, but many of you, most of you probably know of his famous speech in the legislature, in the 1873 legislature, where he makes this point. For those of you that don't, it's a great story. Um, Joseph Navahi was known as an eloquent speaker, an amazing speaker, and he gets up in front of the legislature at one point and he talks about not only Pearl Harbor, but there's another policy. Now this is 73, 70, going into 74. And so we have Kalakaua as Mo'i too at this point. And he talks not only about Pearl Harbor, but also about this $5 million loan that Kalakaua is considering from other nations. And the, oops, and Navahi says, this loan will put us in debt and endanger our sovereignty. This giving away of land will endanger our sovereignty. And he says, I want to tell you a story. He said, there's an example where this has happened before. These two nations were at war in a battle, and it was these two grand nations butting heads and fighting and going to war. And then the war seemed to be a stalemate, and neither side could take precedence. And they battled and they battled and they battled. And there was a break in the fighting. And one of the nations said, okay, we're going to offer you a peace treaty. We'll offer you a deal. Um, and here, take this gift from us, and then we can move on past this battle. And so they gave them this great big giant wooden horse. And the other nation opened the gates and let the horse in. And most of you know what happened. It was the story of the Trojan horse. So think about that. Here's Joseph Navahi, Kanaka Oivi in the 1874 legislature, telling his fellow legislators about the story of the Trojan horse to make an example about how America will step in and they won't step out. Not only was that incredibly prescient, it talks to his brilliance, to his learnedness, and to his leadership. Yeah. Okay, so we have those meetings. So in 1873-74, he stood up. Now, and you know, I, I don't want to make examples to today. I'm, I'm not. I promise I wouldn't do that. But Joseph Navahi stood up and said, "No, the money's not enough." It would be easy to say, "Hey, look, constituents, I brought you all this money." But Navahi said, no, our nation will be endangered in the future. We need to stand and be strong on our own feet. That's a leader. And that was his efforts in the 1873 and 74 legislature. Now, moving into the 1890 and 92 legislatures, Navahi, we have the Bayonet Constitution happening in 1887, forced upon Kalakaua, illegal constitution, um, done without the legislative, legislative approval. And the, it removes Asians and other races from voting. Remember, Asians have had voting since 1852. So for 30 years, Hawaiian, Japanese, Chinese, and others have voted. Now they can't vote. They raise the income clause, which means many poor Hawaiians can't vote. And they're taking over the legislature. It's a horrific uh, constitution that even Albert Francis Judd said is highly flawed. So they start to push to change that constitution. So how are we going to do this? There's a couple of ways. You can just make it happen like they did, but Navahi and the queen later and others want to do it legally. They want to set the foundation for a legal constitution. So there's two ways you can do that. You can do that in the legislature, or you can do that with the, by the queen and the approval of the cabinet. And so they say, we're going to try this route first. So Navahi and William Ponoho Aveoveo Ulokalani White, Senator from Lahaina, are the two main proponents of a constitutional convention that will draft a new constitution making fair rights for all. And they'll get rid of the Bayonet Constitution. And Navahi pushes that and White push that in the legislature. And here's their examples. Another path to justice is the Kekumu Kanavai Ho. This is a scan of the actual petition that came in from Hilo through Navahi for a new constitution. Legislative Assembly Session 1892, petition number 261. Presented by Representative Navahi, July 28, 1892. The petition is transferred to refer to the Select Committee of July 28, 1892. 
Now, a few notes I want to make about this. This is position, petition 261. <laughs> we talk about Hawaiian voice. And we talk about Hawaiian engagement. Now, it wasn't only Hawaiians petitioning, but a, a majority of these petitions were coming in from Hawaiians. That one session of the legislature in 1892 had over 300 petitions. And talk about a government that listened, or, or at least was accessible to its people. Every single petition that came in had to be referred, had to be read on the legislative floor and referred to a legislative committee. Today, if you send an email to the governor, what do you think happens to it? In the kingdom, every petition that came in from the people was sent to committee and was talked about with the committee and voted on. And then if it passed, it would go to the general assembly and so forth. So Navahi brings this petition from the people of Hilo in 1892. Oop. This is the actual petition. Sorry for the poor quality of the photo, but you can, once again, you can go into the state archives and, and view this original petition. So this is from 1892 from Hilo, Hilo Hema, South Hilo, yeah? Um, and these are the names. Many of you I know will, will wanna look at this and see if you have family name here. Um, but this is engagement. This is engagement in governance and Navahi through Yosepa Navahi, right? That's the first one. A second petition, number 262, bring it brought in the same day by Navahi. And here are, here's that petition from South Hilo also. I'll leave it up there for a second so folks can check out names. Ke'alkai, Kahana, okay. Third petition brought in by Navahi on August the 6th for a new constitution. Petition number 305. Oop. Petition number 305. Yeah. These are three of seven petitions that, that Joseph Navahi brought to the Hawaiian Kingdom Legislature in the 1892 session demanding a new constitutional convention. Now, because of the vote, because of that um, loss of power within the legislature because of the Vanette Constitution, they couldn't quite get enough votes. To, to pass a constitutional convention. Yeah, they needed a two thirds vote because of, because of, uh, uh, because of the, the, the uh, cabinet could override. So they couldn't quite get enough votes to have a constitutional convention. So this effort didn't work out for a new constitution, but Navahi and William White had pushed it prolifically in the legislature, okay? So because of that um, push in the Hawaiian Kingdom legislature, um, Navahi, and William White, because it failed, the two of them go to the queen and start talking to the queen about another avenue is for you to declare a constitution and have the cabinet approve it. And that will be a valid constitution, right? Now, this is a story that isn't quite told and it's one of those ones that's, that's a complicated part of that narrative that needs to be understood. Uh, we, we, we mahalo Lilu Uokalani for that constitution. But she herself writes in her biography that she was reticent to do so when William White and Joseph Navahi brought her the idea. Maybe it's not quite time. Maybe we can't do this. And she says, it was William White and Joseph Navahi who convinced me that it was possible. And so they visit with the queen again and again and again. And they say, the voice of the people say, get rid of this awful constitution and bring our rights back to us as Kanaka Uivi. And they sit with her and they draft a, a new constitution. The queen says the main drafters of that constitution were William Punahou White, Joseph Navahi, and Sam Nolan. And so on the 14th of January, 1893, she's set to proclaim this new constitution to bring power back to the people. There's 7,000 people on the lawn of Iolani Palace gathered to hear for once, for, for once in the past seven years, their, their power is gonna be brought back to them. They're in their Sunday best, they're ready. She's prolonging the legislature across the street. She's gonna prolong the legislature. Hui Kalai Aina, the Hawaiian patriotic group, is, has the constitution there. John Alapai is the leader and he's gonna bring it across for her to sign in the blue room of the palace. But the first thing she does that morning in the palace is she meets with Joseph Navahi and William Punohu White and she crowns them Knights Order of Kalakaua, the highest award in the kingdom. And she does that, she says in her own words, January 14th, 10 a.m., Rumi Bolu, Kahaliali'i, the blue room of the, of the Haleali'i, Ilani Palace. That's a quick photo I took of the actual, not, not Navahi's actual award, but one like it, yeah? 
that's a Knight's Order of Kalakaua that he and William White received for their work on the Constitution. And the Queen says, Mr. William White ha had maintained, oh, she says, Nosef Navahi, along with William White, ha had maintained a strict fidelity to the wishes of the people by whom he had been elected. The behavior of these two patriots during the trying scenes of this session, in such marked contrast to that of many others, won them profound respect. They could, not, they could never be induced to compromise principles, nor did they for one minute falter or hesitate in advocating boldly a new constitution which should accord equal rights to the Hawaiians, as well as protect the interests of the foreigners. The true patriotism and love of country of these men had been recognized by me, and I had decorated them with a Knights Commander of Kalakaua. So Queen Lili Ukalani says, these two gentlemen separated themselves from everyone else in that legislature as patriots, as people who could not be compromised. So we're starting to understand his role as one of, if not the greatest patriots of that Hawaiian kingdom. And again, there's many, many, many more stories. Last one I wanna focus on, the third one I wanna focus on is his service in Aloha Aina and his service as a voice of the people. Kahui Hawaii Aloha Aina was founded in 1893 in response to the uh, 1893 coup, a courageous leader of the people. Founded on the 4th of March, 1893 at Arian Hall, across the street from the palace today where the post office is, but on the Diamond Head side, on, on the um, Leahi side, right on the corner there uh, was the opera house. Just behind the opera house was a hall called Arian Hall. That's where the men met on the 4th of March, 1893, led by Joseph Navahi and founded Ka'ahui Hawaii Aloha Aina patriotic group. Yeah, this is a photograph of the group a little bit later as they petitioned Blount to listen to them. Navahi is there just to the, my left, his right of John Cummins with the fabulous uh, beard. Uh, Mr. Cummins was the honorary president. In my mana'o that was because, well, honorary president is like a board member. So your job is to, to raise funds. And Mr. Cummins had plenty of funds and lots of, lots of wealthy friends. Um, so uh, now he was the practical leader, he was the president, uh, and he's there. These gentlemen were the leaders of this group that came to become, oh, actually I'll save that for this slide. Okay, I wanna, I wanna read you the constitution. This is uh, a photograph I took of the constitution, partial, par partial constitution. And I'm gonna, I translated just the purpose on the, on the left here. I'm gonna read the English. The object of this association is to preserve and maintain by all legal and peaceful means and measures the independent autonomy of the Hawaiian archipelago. And if our independence cannot be maintained, our object shall be to exert all peaceful influence, peaceful and legal efforts to secure the Hawaiian people and citizens the continuance of their civil rights. That's actually the, the translation that was given by them in the, in the document. Um, one of the interesting side notes of, we have, of that constitution was that um, offices within the group had to be held by uh, Kanaka Oivi. Um, members who weren't Kanaka Oivi be could become honorary members. It's interesting that it's different in the women's group. In the women's group, uh, non-Hawaiians could be regular members, but not officers. Um, but in the men's group, uh, non-Hawaiians were um, honorary members. Okay, so there's the constitution. Um, a couple of notes about Hui Aloha Aina, which many of us know about. It became the largest Kanaka Oivi political organization in history to that point. Now think about that. From the start of the Hawaiian Kingdom, 1843, to this point, this was the, the largest political group formed. 8,000 members. Now I put an asterisk next to there because of the interesting and, 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 and fun reality that that group was, was quickly passed uh, as the largest political group in the nation's history by the women's group. The women's group of Hui Aloha Aina ended up having 11,500 uh, members and became the largest political group in Hawaiian history. Um, and at that point, but the men were, were there at that 8,000. Another note that sometimes is, is not talked about a lot, we know that Cleveland sent a mission to, re, to, to figure out what happened, right? Well, why did he do that? 
Well, three days after they were founded, Hui Hawaii Aloha Aina, Joseph Navahi penned a letter to the President of the United States asking for an investigation. A, what do you call it, telegram went out from Hawaii to San Francisco, traveled across, traveled, you know, across by cable then to the United States, to the President, asking the President, because he knew the provisional government men had a two week head start on the Queen's ambassadors. Navahi was smart enough to say, you know, they had already been there, they had already told their stories, hey, you need to listen to the larger voice. There's, a, there's things that have gone on here you, have, you know nothing about. And so four days after, after um, organizing, they send a petition to the president to launch an investigation, which he does, which eventually produces the Blount Report. Now, interesting note, we all talk about, not all, I'm sorry, we all, but, but often you'll hear about the Kuei petition as the petition. There's, I've found so far 14 petitions from Hui Loha Aina, Hui Kalai Aina, and others against annexation for restoration and so forth to the president and to Congress. So those voices were out there in a prolific sense and continuing. Yeah. Okay. And finally, the men's group joined the 1897 petition movement begun by Kahui Hawaii Aloha Aina Ahu Ho'omau Kuokoa Ana Lady, which was the formal title of the women's group that was delivered to the US Congress in 1898 and was successful in defeating the Treaty of Annexation. At a meeting in Hilo, Hawaii, uh, we have recently found that uh, located the actual spot of the Salvation Army Hall, there next to the, a little bit up from the bandstand on the park grounds, now it's a parking lot, was where women came together and some men uh, and held a Hui Loha Aina meeting that launched the Kuei petitions uh, that became that over 10,000 signatures that would go to Washington and demand a, demand a stop to annexation. And we know that they were successful. They could not attain a, a, a treaty of annexation because of the voice of Kanako Iwi who were delivered there to the state cap, to the United National Capital. Okay. So, those are three incidents where Navahi stood out and took action. Um, he was not a proud, he was not an egotistical man. Everyone talks about that. Everyone talks about his humility, but he didn't allow his humility to stop him from stepping up when his people needed it. He stood up and founded Hui Hawaii Aloha Aina. He stood up and challenged the Treaty of Reciprocity when it benefited a lot of folks in government, including Kalakaua and others. Now, if you wanna talk in the, in the comments after about the role of Kalakaua and else, I'll be happy to. But know that Mo, uh, Navahi became a staunch critic of, not, of some of the policies of Kalakaua. I ran into a archivist, I ran into a researcher a few years back from Harvard who was in, uh, Hawaiian mission houses, and she came up to me and she's like, oh my gosh, did you know that Kalakaua was, or that Navahi was against Kalakaua? I thought Navahi, Navahi was a patriot. Da -da -da. And I had to explain to her, Navahi was against policies of Kalakaua. But the moment the nation was, was, at, was in jeopardy, he backed Kalakaua. He, he said, no, I have criticisms of my mo'i, but you do not take out my mo'i. You do not endanger my nation. So like any courageous leader, he challenged Kalakaua on policies he thought were poor, but immediately defended Kalakaua against, against claims to his power. So in that sense, again, Navahi was a loyalist, but also loyal to his, to his monarchy. Okay. Now, having said that, I want to bring to you to my favorite document, one of the ones that really, really blew me away. Uh, and that I just can't even believe the courage it must have taken to write this letter. So in 1894, as the Blount Report has, had, had come out, as, I'm sorry, late 1893, um, as the minister had been revoked, as a new minister had been sent by Cleveland with instructions to restore the queen, um, he comes and meets with the queen. And we know that the queen refused clemency at first, and later agreed to it for the for the the usurpers, and that because of her acceptance of that, we know of and and you know the the, the agreement between Cleveland and Lilu has been made quite a bit of, and and it should be noted in history. 
but understand something incredibly important. And that's what, what were the people saying at that time? And Joseph Navahi represented the largest group of people in the kingdom. And so when he heard rumors, not only of talks between the queen and Willis, but also false rumors of the fact that the US would buy the queen out, would offer her $100,000 to take the crown lands and, 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 and sign an abdication and all that stuff. When he heard all of these different rumors, he, got, he pulled together Aloha Aina and he wrote this letter, this following letter to her. And I wanna read it to you, it's a little long, so please bear with me, but I want you to hear his voice and the courage within that letter where he challenges his mo'i, his, his revered mo'i. He writes letters to the queen that are incredibly reverent, but he needed to say something for the benefit of his nation, and he does so in this letter. So I'm gonna read that to you. It's gonna be on really small type on your screen, but I have it here to read. Okay. To Her Majesty Queen Lili Uokalani, Oops, sorry. Sovereign of the Hawaiian Kingdom. May it please your gracious majesty. The undersigned, loyal and respectful subjects of the Hawaiian Kingdom and of your majesty take the liberty of humbly submitting to your majesty what follows. To wit, that they are the officers and executive body of a political association called Hui Aloha Aina Ohava'i, embracing a membership of, only, of over 8,000 registered voters united for the express purpose of preserving the integrity of the Hawaiian monarchy under your, delegate, under your majesty's rule, that in their above capacity and in virtue of that delegation, of the delegation unto them given by the members of the said association, the undersigned have, ever since the revolution of, eight, of January of eight, 17th, 1893, used all of their endeavors, efforts, power, and influence, and those of the members of the association. Thank you. Sorry? Oh, sorry. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, meeting, uh, la, la, la. and those of the members of the association through organization, meetings, petitions, testimony, and other legal means for the object of helping to bring about the restoration of your majesty as sovereign of the kingdom. That these efforts attended at times with danger to the, their lives and property and to the lives and property of the members who follow their leadership have created bet between themselves and their followers a reciprocal bond of interest, obligations, and responsibilities, whereby the members of the association expect from the aforementioned officers and executive body the proper information. So Navahi is saying, the, I'm promising our members that they're getting the right information and that we're doing right by them. News and instruction for their guidance and expect them to attend to all the objects of the association and the carrying out of the political mean measures necessary for the complete restoration of the Hawaiian monarchy on a firm basis, whereby the autonomy of the nation and the peace and prosperity of its inhabitants may be secured forever. That among the foremost measures expected by your people and promised by our association is the promulgation by your majesty of a new constitution, more just and liberal to your own people. And finally, that the members of our association will look out to the undersigned in their above capacities and hold them responsible for any failure in the carrying out of such measures as designed, designed and deemed necessary by your people. So Navahi tells the queen, there's rumor going around. Oh, Kalamai, Kalamai. Navahi tells the queen, there's rumor going around that you're going to accept this deal from the United States, that you're going to offer those guys clemency and then we're gonna go back to the Bayonet Constitution, which was the deal. And Navahi says, that's not what the people want. And I need to know the truth from you so I can tell them because they're holding us responsible. He goes on. Therefore, the undersigned feel that it is an imperious duty of theirs to respectfully represent to your majesty that the members of the Hui Aloha Aina are at present laboring under serious apprehension and fears lest through ill-advised and hasty concessions, the future of the kingdom may be jeopardized at the very moment when the impending restoration of your majesty would otherwise fill the hearts of your people with gladness and fulfill the wishes of your faithful subjects who have, bravely, who have been bravely standing by your majesty through all these long months of dangers, insults, and anxious waiting. 
it has been announced by the local papers and not contradicted that Minister Willis, after negotiating with your majesty personally and secretly, without the advice or any real, of any real representative of your people, has requested the provisional government to surrender on condition of your majesty promising to respect the old bayonet constitution of 1887 and agreeing to grant the rebels who have attempted to sell the country a full political amnesty. On this matter, we wish to, allow, to be allowed to state, number one, the restoration being not a favor, but an obligation of justice on the, Amer of the American government ought to be done without any restrictive conditions. <laughs> Brilliant. So Navahi says to the queen, it's, we don't need to make deals. The United States needs to restore you to power without condition. And he says, and your majesty owes to the Hawaiian people who have stood by you to now stand by them and not sacrifice one iota of their rights. Kalamai. Kalamai. Um, again, I can't imagine the courage it took him to say this to her, right? And it's a complicated situation. Nobody's blaming her, but he's speaking for the, he's, he's speaking the voice of the people to the queen. And he says, therefore, in the event of your majesty, considering that certain concessions might be granted, only such as might be personal to your majesty ought to be acceded to privately but any conditions interesting the whole nation, such as those especially of constitution and amnesty, ought not to be granted except after due consultation with the representatives of your people. And, the, and in the event of your majesty not considering your present cabinet as representing the nation, we claim that the nearest and most authoritative representatives of the people in the present circumstance are the officers of Hui Oha Aina, who have proved their loyalty to your person and their discretion and trustworthiness. Moreover, your majesty should remember that, by, that the entering by you in your official capacity into any secret agreement with Minister Willis would be a violation of all constitutional principles and would not be binding on your restored cabinet, not on any other that might follow who as executive power would be responsible to the people for such agreement and their fearful consequences taken without their previous consent. Now, I don't, <laughs> I don't mean to throw a monkey wrench into everyone's political machinations of the day. But what Navahi is saying is that you can't make a deal like the Cleveland Liuklani Agreement or any deal that has conditions without the voice of the people or that's not constitutional. He says, number two, in the matter of the Constitution, apart from the desires and expectations of the Hawaiian people for a new instrument canceling the injustices of the last one, which has virtually been abrogated by the rebels themselves, your majesty, your majesty should consider the consequences to yourself and to your people resulting from the restoration of the old one. You must admit that through the odious and unjust property qualifications which have disenfranchised your native subjects in their own country and given virtual control of the election to the moneyed classes, these mortal enemies of your majesty and your people, the old constitution would again give back to those same enemies the legislative power of the land, which they would soon control again through the former money tactics. He says, number three, the question of amnesty is equally dangerous and gets more so when combined with the constitutional one. Since this would confirm to all the present rebels and enemies of our autonomy, all their civil rights of electing and being elected and of governing, and it is useless for us to state to your majesty how the better and unprincipled bitter and unprincipled rebels would use these rights to seal your fate and that of your people. In fact, with such an amnesty together with keeping the old constitution, our members consider that the country would be worse off than it is now and that past troubles would be sure to repeat themselves in a very short while. By your majesty conceding these two points, if the rumor be correct, you are therefore virtually surrendering yourself and your people to the enemy. And this is sufficient to justify our alarm and the misbodings of our association. But these sentiments of ours are further increased, further increased if we give credence to the rumor that these untimely and ruinous concessions on which the Hui Aloha Aina have not been consulted have been counseled to your majesty by certain unrepresentative advisors whom your majesty well knows are disliked, mistrusted, and feared for very good reason by all your loyal subjects. These advisors have done nothing for your majesty in the past crisis but cheap talk, while your majesty's strength lies in the fight made by you 
for you by the Hui Aloha Aina. If your majesty is willing to run personally the dangers we allude to, it is the duty we owe to ourselves and to our families to protest and ask that at least you may not jeopardize the nation's interest and future and nullify the efforts we have made to save our country from the pirates who have seized it. The undersigned hope your majesty will excuse this plain talk, but as they claim to have proven that none are more loyal and faithful subjects than me, than them, they respectfully think that they are entitled to the favor of expressing before your majesty the opinions of, the fo of their followers and to a right also of being awarded some proof of confidence and trust. Moreover, in view of the responsibilities that weigh on their shoulders through the confidence of the members of the Hui, they wish to place themselves on record as having dutifully sounded the alarm so that they may not be blamed if the members get discouraged and apathetic when they hear that their hopes and expectations of a good, stable, and just native government are frustrated. Of your majesty, the most humble and obedient subjects, Honolulu, this 10th day of December, 1893, Joseph Navahi, J.A. Cummins, J.W. B. Picani, John Bush, Albert Marquez, W. H. Ricard, John Ross, and W. L. Servant. So, um, and where that document is, I mean, the, the mana in this palapala and where, where had it has been and the voice it carries. So when the queen was arrested in 1895, Albert Francis Judd, the Supreme Court minister, and, Lu and William, Ch William, Owen, William Owen Smith, the attorney general, went to the palace, broke into the queen's safe and her writing desk and took all the personal documents out of her safe. Those are her documents that she had kept, the most important ones, including letters to her that were in, of support from Huila Aina around the nation, all kinds of important letters. That collection was taken by the, by the Republic used against her in, in the court hearings and then became, and then was set, and then became state documents. Um, therefore, they are at the Hawaii State Archives today. And they're in a collection called M93, which is the legal collection, but under a separated collection that's called the seized documents. So the queen kept this letter from Joseph Navahi in her private safe in her house. So there's so much going on there. And there's so much to think about. And there's so much to, for, the poli for the political scientists to run with. Um, the point, I think, for me is not, is he right? Is he right on this point? Is the queen right on this point? Did she do the right? Those things are, are we've got plenty of time to discuss those. This letter gives evidence of Iosepa Navahi's patriotism, of his courage to step up and say and demand that the voice of 8,000 of his members and 11,500 of the women's members be heard on this important matter. So as these histories become more complicated, we not only run into problems in our history that we have to figure out, but we run into evidence of just how courageous folks were. Okay, that's that letter. So, when, Kalamai. So coming out of that, 1894, we have the arrest of Navahi and others. On December 9th, 1894, about two weeks before the planned Kuaku Loco to take back the government and replace the queen, the government has a, a, a colleague of mine, Ralph Cam, is writing an article right now for the Hawaiian Journal of History that should be fascinating. It's from all the spy reports. The Republic of Hawaii hired spies to infiltrate Huiloha Aina, Kanaka and non-Kanaka. And they reported back to the provisional government and the Republic in weekly reports. And those reports are at the state archives. Um, so the government knew what was going on. And so they preempted the Kawaku local by arresting Navahi, Bush, and a few others. Navahi had a home because he had been spending so much time in, in Hawaii, in Honolulu, in the legislature. He leased a home or he bought, he leased property uh, up in Kapalama. Um, it was the former home of, of uh, Queen, Queen Ruth, or Princess Ruth. Uh, it had gone to Bishop, Bishop Estate, and Bishop Estate leased it to Navahi. Um, Lili, who lived up there also, had a house up there also. It's, so Navahi's house, we, Ralph is the one who found it. Because of the development, he figured out it's literally right underneath the street 
behind Kamakapili Church today. Um, we located it exactly, and, and last year we brought out chalk and, and outlined his house and said, this is Navahi's house. We stopped traffic and we had a big thing. Um, but we know where he lived now. Um, and on that, on December 9th, the morning of December 9th, there was a knock on the door. He had a home with his wife, Emma. He had stables and horses. And it was the police, the marshal, coming to do a search. They had a search warrant for his home to search for sundry arms and ammunition in his plot to overthrow the government. They didn't find any arms and ammunition in his home. They, fought, they found some at, at, uh, at Bush's house. And they arrested them both for conspiracy to overthrow the government. Navahi went to prison, Oahu prison, the filthy, disease-ridden prison. It's there at that prison that he contracted tuberculosis that would take his life soon after. Uh, he went to trial apart from those Kawaku Loco trials, because those were under mar martial law in, in a military court, but Navahi was arrested beforehand in December. So he went to a jury trial, or to a, to a uh, government trial, uh, and was found not guilty. So he was released in March. So he was in prison from December to March. Uh, long enough for him to contract the tuberculosis that would kill him. So he died, as I mentioned, in 1896. His wife, Emma, took over the paper. Uh, the queen wrote about his death and she said, I share the common sorrow, for this was a great blow to the people. He had always been a man who had fearlessly advocated the independence of Hawaii. Uh, I don't have, I, I know I'm running late, so I don't want to, I don't have enough time, but there are, in the book, in the a book that the folks in Hilo put, uh, republished uh, beautifully, um, there are hundreds, I believe close to 300 uh, letters of condolence and um, Kanikau written for Navahi that flooded into, uh, into Mrs. Navahi. Um, the funeral was started from his home there in Kapalama. Um, I've got some photographs from the Hawaii State Archives uh, that are the original photographs of the funeral. Now this first one, all the rest of them are claimed as Navahi funeral photos that it's written on the back of them. This one doesn't have that on the back of it, which means as a proper historian, I have to say, I'm not 100% sure this is his funeral. I'm 99% sure. Uh, it was 1896. It was with the Royal Hawaiian Band. It was downtown. Um, but this is the first photo. Um, this one we know, we know is of, his, of Navahi's funeral. <clears throat> and it's the uh, leaving of the uh, ocean funeral for Navahi. So his body was carried from his home in procession down to uh, the church uh, where Reverend Timoteo, Enoch Samaya Timoteo, gave a, uh, gave a eulogy, um, packed, packed eulogy. And then thousands and thousands, they say about 12,000 folks, marched down to the wharf to see his body off um, on the steamship. <clears throat> um, his body was going to go straight to Hilo, but they ended up making a stop in Maui. And on Maui in Lahaina, um, the Hui Loha Aina group of women had, had gathered to, to, to greet Mrs. Navahi and give her condolences. William White rode out to meet Mrs. Navahi, and then they all met her on shore. But then they continued on to Hilo. This is the boat getting ready to leave, and folks wishing him, uh, sending him off. This is arriving in Hilo. Um, so from the steamship, they went to these uh, um, and they had kind of an ocean funeral uh, from there into Hilo Bay. Um, some pretty amazing photographs uh, of how they welcomed the body of Navahi back to Hilo. And this one. Yeah. And this one. And then they had a funeral there in Hilo. Um, as I mentioned, Reverend Timoteo, he said, we look upon this coffin and the earthly body of the man that the people looked to as the ship's mast, the supporting pillar, the advisor, and the only leader to unite the minds of the people ev everywhere. Now these words aren't just words thrown out, yeah? They're, they're, they're thought about, how do we recognize this man? How do I see this man? Reverend Enoch Samaya Timoteo, to plug out, future project I'm doing. Um, he was one of my favorite reverends. He was a close confidant of the queen. He presided over Navahi's funeral. He um, is buried at Wainai Cemetery. And so we're working on a project to 
uh, Ho'onani his, his burial site uh, and, talk, and talk about his life. That'll be hopefully in the fall. Um, okay, that's that. So finishing up, uh, historiography in Hawaii. So now that we've got an idea, a small idea, as I mentioned, talk to the folks in Hilo, talk to the folks at the school, talk to your kumu. There, there are folks that have hundreds of other stories. We start, we, we, we start to understand his place in history, right? There's no question. He was one of the greatest leaders of this nation. So where does he stand? Where do we see him? When do we hear about him? Is his presence in Hawaii Nei the same as the presence of George Washington in the United States? So we start to ask ourselves why, we know why, but we also start to ask ourselves the question of what can we do about it? What's our kuleana? And again, I'm not gonna tell you your kuleana, but I wanna encourage you that you do have power to make a change. You can change that narrative, the historiography of Hawaii in Hawaii Nei. Let's look at that, go back to, oh, I didn't tell you, did I skip that one? Okay, bear with me. I skipped a couple of slides that are important at the opening. <laughs> and they would have made my finish much better, but we'll go back to them. Okay, so in that biography of Navahi, oh, they're missing? Go back, go back. Okay, I promise I'm getting there. Nope. Okay, I must have missed them, so I'm sorry. So in that biography of Navahi, that's fine. Um, there's an opening preface by Sheldon, and he writes about Navahi, a beautiful tribute, and he says he's like the greatest leaders of the world. Like, like other great nations have their great leaders, we have ours. And so he says, he's like this man and this man. And so I wanted to talk to you guys about how were those people thought about and honored and how's Navahi? So I looked up, Sheldon says, hey, pohaku hao ole ko elalani. England has Gladstone, yeah? England has Gladstone, this great leader who was the force in the nation. So I went on Google right there. He's got about 12 statues around the country, including the Gladstone statue in London, England. He says, hey, Bismaka ho'i ko Kelamania. Yeah, Spain has Bismarck, or Germany has Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck has a statue in Hamburg, including other places around the country. Hey, I hate these English editions. Hey, Alacanadero Colucia. Yeah, Russia has Alexander. Alexander III has prolific statues around Russia. Hey, Garibaldi, Coitalia. Rome, Italy has that statue of Garibaldi. Hey, Colombo, Busso, Cosepania. Columbus in Barcelona, Spain. Hey, Washington, Washingtona, Co Amalia. Washington, D.C. has the frickin' <laughs> Washington Monument. Hey, Ahe Navahi Ho'i, Co Hawaii but we have no monuments. Um, we have a 40 foot bronze statue of President McKinley in downtown Honolulu. We have the Kamehameha statue that we're all rightfully very proud of. But how do these other nations honor their leaders and how do we? Um, and so I want you to think about this. I mentioned earlier that this coming year, Eva Elementary School would have their 179th anniversary of Abe Lincoln Day. Check out what happened just a few years ago, two years ago, the February 8th, 18, 2019 celebration in Eva of Abraham Lincoln Day, where the Lincoln statue is. I'm gonna play a little video for you, which means I'm gonna to have to open this up. And I want you to see how we honor Abe Lincoln in Hawaii. Oh, Darcy, I'm not going to have volume, am I? I'll have to do that thing again. I'll have to do that thing again, right, Darcy? The thing again? <laughs> oh, well, it's not, not going to play the volume, right? I got to play it the volume. It was playing something. Oh, was it? You heard it? 
I heard ding ding. No, it's hold on, we'll see. Oh, where am I? Hello, my. Okay, there. Oop, there's that. Click. I don't think you're gonna hear volume. I'm gonna play it off my phone. But let's see. Can you hear that? Oh, okay, great. Uh, it stopped. See if you can make it full screen. I don't know why I did that. There we go. Good morning and aloha, everyone. Thank you. It's a great to be here for the 75th annual Lincoln Day program. Governor Ige's father and my father went to Eva Elementary School and I attended Eva Elementary School. There's so many memories, so many things that we've learned that we carry through our lives, and it all started here for me at Eva Elementary School. Okay, today we celebrate the 75th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln. We unveiled the statue in 1944 with student performances, which we carry on today. And some of the traditions we have are the reciting of the Gettysburg Address, the Royal Hawaiian Band, and a lot of student performances speeches. Recently, we added the Lincoln Day Essay Contest, and that mini essay was there today. It's always a special day when we have Lincoln Day whether it's the 75th annual or just um, every year's Lincoln Day is as special as any other. And uh, we thank the parents for supporting us and uh, faculty and staff for all the hard work. So, can you hear me? So, that's Hawaii ne, ikiya manava, ikamoko evo, ko Hawaii pai aina. Yeah, in these days we are we are having Abraham Lincoln days, where the kids have a have a writing contest saying, "I want to be just like you, Abraham Lincoln." And I had a talk with one of the DOE, a friend, a person in DOE, in my last presentation, and she made a great point, and that was. She didn't, she works in the immersion program and, and, and other uh, charter schools and things like that for the DOE. And she's like, you know, I, I kind of thought we were doing okay because I knew, uh, I knew us. But the schools, the DOE, yeah, Hawaii, Apao is still doing stuff like this. So I ask, um, you know, is it, you know, is it, you know, possible for us to, uh, to, to make a change, yeah? Um, so what's our kuleana to the past? Again, what's it, each one of ours? There were 60 something people, 70 something people that signed on here today. We had a hundred and something register. Um, what's each one of our kuleana to these mo'olelo? Each one of us can go on Facebook and bitch about the government and say, can you believe our leaders? Can you believe how they don't respect this and that and this and that? But we can also see if we can make a difference. Um, and I want to show you a couple of things. So what's that historiography going to be in 2050? So I'll close this. Actually, I'm going to go back to here. I'm going to go back to the first slide. And I promise I'm almost done. <clears throat> okay, can you see me? Okay, so <clears throat> um, You're, the people out there that I, I saw some of the people on here, we have brilliance here, brilliance here. And we have folks that are working themselves to the bone. Darcy's one of them. Um, all of us are, are making effort 
and, and, and people are creating incredible things. We need the math. We need, we need folks around Hawaii to, 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 to figure out what they want to do, what they can do. Um, one thing you can do, I'll give you a couple of examples, and, and I know folks can run with ideas. <clears throat> As I mentioned, any of the resources that are in this talk um, that you're welcome to use, if you want you know, you know, anything else in that, in that realm, uh, come into the State Archives, we can help you out. Um, the Poyala Aina cards I want to mention because um, I, I still have those going. M many of you may have known about this project, but it was just an effort to get primary source materials into classrooms without jumping a thousand hurdles, without getting permission from principals and the DOE and all that stuff. And I thought if I just make stuff and, and ask the teachers if they want it, teachers will get it in the classroom if they want to. And it worked out. Um, the Lahui stepped up and and, and supported the program. I've had people from hundreds of people send me $10 checks, $50 checks, $10, $5 checks, $2, you know, hand, here you go. And I've been able to produce the cards. Now the cards are 10 Po'eloha Aina, including Joseph Navahi and Emma with primary resource research on the back, um, material from my research over the last whatever, 10, 15 years. Uh, and, and allusion to primary sources. And I wanted them physical because I wanted students to have them, to own them. These aren't for the teachers. The teachers get a pack. But if you have a class of 30, I'll send you 30 packs, plus yours, 32 packs. Um, and they're absolutely free. I didn't want there to be any impediments to getting this information to the students. And so my goal was 10,000 cards into the classroom. Um, and last year we blew past 10,000 and so I changed my goal to 50,000 and at the end of this year just this year's end I did the final counting We're, the project's still going but we've put 47,000 native Hawaiian hero cards into 75 classrooms around Hawaii and it hasn't cost uh, you know teachers a dime it's only you know it's it's been a it's been forced it's been sourced from the people um, I have thousands left. Plans for, for next year are, uh, we're putting out a Hawaiian language version in March probably, and then we're hitting 10 more Patriots. Um, folks like, that I have now are folks like Abigail, Abigail Campbell, Timoteo Ha'alelio, Kahalevi uh, Campbell, her husband, John Campbell, Mrs. Prendergrass, John Henry Wise, and Mrs. Emma Nakawina. And we'll do 10 more. And we'll continue to give our Haumana opportunities to find people they admire. Um, there's thousands of people like that out there. And so on our big scale, Joseph Navahi, let's get him into everywhere. Another example, um, that glass plate negative is, is public property. Everything at the State Archives is. So it, when you come in, if you want a digital version of that glass plate negative in high resolution, it costs you a grand total of 25 cents. And if you want to, if you want to scan of something we haven't scanned yet, then we charge, I think the, I think the charge is $10, it could be up to $20 for color and all that kind of stuff. Because we have to, we have to, archivists have to run through that process. But if it has already been scanned, it costs you a quarter. So 87 people here today, 10 of us go get that digital negative, go to Kinko's, raise a hundred bucks, get 10 11 by 14 brilliant photos made of Navahi, put them in frames you got from Target, and go to the library and say, go to the public, the school library and say, hey, and tell the librarian, can we put up a picture of Joseph Navahi so the students that wonder who he is? And we put a picture of Joseph Navahi in every school library in Hawaii Ne. Um, it's just a matter of, 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 of deciding to do it. Um, that's my speech. <laughs> um, I wanna thank you for being here today. I, I, I am awed by, by all of you taking all of this time. I'm running up about two hours now, I, I apologize. Uh, the, the, the problems within the thing were all mine. Darcy helped uh, fix them. Um, but thank you so much for coming today. For listening today and I and all I ask of you is that you pass this story along in whatever way you feel appropriate. Um, 
we'll we'll answer questions now. I'll stay here as long as as long as the questions are people. I understand if people if people go, but if there's topics you want to talk about, uh, I'm open to it. Uh, mahalo. Mahalo. I we do have some questions. Okay. Um, I don't know if if you are the one to answer this, but somebody was asking if there's be, there will be a ceremony or protocol at the gravesite on the thirteenth. Right. I, I, yeah. I, I. That's out of my hands. Um, I imagine there usually is every year. Um, but it's but it's but in my in my understanding and my knowledge, it's it's small groups, it's individual groups. Lynette guys often go. Hilo folks often come up. I don't know if there's an organized uh, thing. You know, they're saying five people per event and all that stuff. The other one, um, Paani's asking if you know where Navahi's medal is, the Order of Kalakaua one. Great question. I, I don't. I don't. And that's um, that's something that, you know, uh, if the Ohana knows and, and want to talk about, that's their kuleana. But, but you know, I, but I personally don't know. Okay. One of the, one of the problems, I would, say, I would say one of the problems is, so my hero, my other hero, Joseph, or William Punahu White, his family, they know his award ended up leaving the family and they're looking for it. And so they're wondering if it's one of the ones in the palace. The problem is the awards aren't inscribed. So, so all of them look alike. So there's no names on them. So we don't really know for many of them. Wow. Okay. And then um, Harry was asking if there's a title of the petition to her majesty to not accept Cleveland's um, condition. Um, it just says, let me see. It just says it's to her gracious majesty and so forth. Uh, let me pull it up here. If you want to, if you want to see it yourself in person, I can give you, I can tell you how in just one moment, I'm going to pull this up. Um, I've got digital copies if anybody wants them, but yeah, it's just at the top, it says to her majesty, Queen Liliokani, sovereign of the Hawaiian kingdom. So it's four pages, it's yellow paper. It was rolled up and it was in her safe. Um, M93 is the, is the manuscript collection for the queen and it's under, it's under seized documents. So it's, it's a, it's a part of the M93 collection called seized documents. And all you have to, and there's a finding aid actually online. So if you go to the Hawaii state archives, all of our finding aids are finding aids are online under archival resources. And so you can check and check and get the exact number before you go. But even if you don't, if you come into the archives and tell them you want to see that letter, it's in the C's documents of M93. They'll help you find it. Okay. Oh, I should mention, I'm going to get in big trouble for this. <laughs> um, two things. Number one, I don't speak for the state archives when I do these talks. I, am, I, I speak for Ron Williams as a researcher. Um, that's, I want, that's, you know, that's, they, they want that clear and I want that clear too. This is my mana'o. But also, um, while everything in the Hawaii State Archives is public, which means you're allowed by law to access every, anything, there are things that are incredibly precious and incredibly fragile that you need to make an appointment for because they'll, have to, they'll schedule an archivist who's had training to sit with that document and turn the pages for you and take care of it and so forth. And I hope everyone is happy that we do that because it makes sure that these documents are around 200 years for your mo'opuna. But, but yes, yeah, so don't so don't run in and, and demand to see this. If you want to see this document, I'm not sure if this is one of those documents or not, but just email the Hawaii State Archives and, and, and say you want to see this and they'll tell you if, it, if an appointment is needed or not. But for most of the documents, you can just walk in and see. Okay. Um, so, and there's a request to stop sharing your screen. I think they want to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, <look at> <laughs> is asking, are the signatures on the document um, superimposed upon a typed and translated document. That was that long so, letter from Navahi, right. I think. So, um, I don't have the, the, the original in front of me. I believe from remembering seeing it that it is the original, that it hasn't been typed. It's my belief, I could, you know, it's my 95% belief that that was the original that they typed. And I think they used English on purpose to get it no, to get right into to to because they were speaking to a large audience, not just her. I think you know. I think you know things were moving fast, and they didn't. You know, they wanted word to get out that they had made this demand and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so it's my understanding and my belief that that's the original that they were that they signed on that paper. Um, 
I don't have it in front of me, so I don't know, but, and you, but you're, you're welcome to come check it out. Okay. And are the Kaniko for Navahi at the archives? Dallas is asking. Um, those are within the Sheldon book that's been published by, I think it was Halikua Mo'o, is one of the, one of the Hilo groups. Um, and those are within that book. I think that book is up publicly on like Ulukau or Papakila, one of those things. Yeah. Um, we don't, we don't have, we don't have Kanika for Navi there at the State Archives. One thing I should explain also, the Hawaii State Archives is a public government archive, which means it's quite different than Bishop Museum or Hawaiian Mission Houses or Hawaiian Historical Society, which are private archives. Our primary kuleana is government records. So those are our priority. We, we do get manuscript collections in, like from the Queen and others, but those are rare. And when we do, those are separate collections. But in general, most of our records are government records. So yes, we have records of the queen as queen, but we just have her personal stuff because we got lucky and she decided to send them to us, the territorial archives. But personal stuff is usually gonna be at those other archives, but we do have some. Uh, again, check out the Hawaii State Archives archive page. Under manuscript collections is a list of all of our manuscript collections. We do have um, Theodore Kelsey, we have, um, who was the Kanako Evie person that worked with him? Uh, I forget, but, but we have a lot of uh, uh, really interesting mentioning collections. Um, somebody's asking about the cards. I put um, Ron's email address in the chat. Yeah. So if you scroll up, you'll see the email address. Um, and then Carmel is asking for if we can receive a copy of the PowerPoint. Okay, so the cards, um, I should make really clear because I get in trouble with this every time. Um, if you're a Kumu who has students, and it can be a Kumu Hula or Hui or something, like that. if you're a Kumu who has students, I'm absolutely happy to send them out to you. But individuals, I have to say, you, I have to run into you. You have to come get them from me or so forth because I just literally do not have time. It's a one-man operation. And I, I literally, if I panned behind you, you'd see half my living room is covered in envelopes. So I, I, I get hundreds of requests and I can't, I can't, and I don't have a car. <laughs> so I can't go to the post office and do individuals at this time, the color my. But, um, but if you want to form a hui and you want 20, that's cool. Um, but yeah, it, if you're a kumu, email me, no problem. So that's the cards. Uh, the PowerPoint, I don't give out PowerPoints, but the presentation will be public. So you can watch it as many times as you need to get all the information. So the information is there, uh, but I, just, I, don't, I don't put out my PowerPoints. Okay, there was one more question about the cards. If it's just for school or if hala hula can. Absolutely hala hula. Absolutely. Okay. We've had lots of halal hula. We've had, I've had, you know, homeschoolers. If you've, you know, if you've got a group of homeschoolers and you've got six, you know, go for it. And if you're, and if you're, if you're wondering, email me and, I, and I'll be, you know, I'll be honest if I can. Yeah. Those are all of the, the questions. Um, I just opened it up so you can unmute yourself if you have other questions. Yeah. Anybody has any final questions? Feel free. Any mana'o? Harry lost his video. Call him my, I don't know what's going on, Harry. Don't be shy. Because um, the videos are still going. Uh, so it's probably on your end. Can I say something? Please do. Cookie. Mahalo, Ron. I, I'm just so appreciative. And um, I learned so much tonight and I appreciate and I love you. And I just wanted to say that very quickly. And this was wonderful. I love you. Oh, oh, one, of the, one of the amazing reasons I'm blessed. People like me and Darcy and others. Um, thank you. Ikumu, mahalo no kohana no kalahui, no ke ia hoike, mahalo nui. Hini no kau. Are there any, you know, I, I, I find myself doing the best I can in, in, in my realm with my, my, my school and my, my homana and the people who I have contact with. But um, because I'm isolated, you know, I, and it's partly just because, you know, pa'ahana, it's busy, yeah. But um, I'm wondering if there is a place that all of these, because I'm seeing the list of people, I just clicked on participants. There's so many people I admire that are on this, on this Zoom, you know, and. I'm wondering if there is a, a, um, a place where people meet, you know, online or something for, for, these, for these minds to get together because I would love to, to brainstorm ways to claim more space. I, I would love to be a part of that, at least be a part of the conversation. 
I know. Great question and great idea. Um, I, I don't, I don't do that myself. I don't run that myself, but I'm happy to be a small part of it. Uh, if anybody wants to, um, one thing I will mention, a couple of things. There's a group, uh, there's a group within the College of Ed that is, um, I'm speaking, I'm doing a couple of talks for that group coming up in January in a couple of weeks, and they're inviting teachers to to come in and get resources and so forth. So, so as far as a resource, physical resource, there's one option. But as far as a mental and an EK. That's, yeah, I would, I would love to sit in, in, a, in a group that was formed out of some of these folks too. So if you have a, you know, if, if you want to work with Darcy to create something, now I don't, I don't want to assume that anyone who joined this allows me to send their email out. Um, but if, if we, you want to work with Darcy to figure that out, I don't want to put work on Darcy either. But if, if anybody here wants to say, hey, let's start this every Friday, then I'm, I'm, I'm up for being a part of that. Well, I, I, I would I would love to be a part of that as well. So um, I think uh, Darcy responded to an email earlier when we were trying to get on. So I'll just send her an email and, and, and see if she has ideas. And then we'll take it slow. No, 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 not too much Kuliana on one person, but just to, to see if we can get something going. I think it'd be awesome. Sounds great. And, and don't forget, you know, email me or let me let, or hit me up. Thank you, brother. Okay. Yeah. Nope. Darcy, any last words? Aloha, oh. uh, Ron. Hi, it's Makalena. Thank you for yes. sharing all this Ike with us. Uh, I do have a question. Hi. You talked about, I believe you said 10 of the hero cards. Yes. And you gave it to me at the library. I appreciate it. And I'd oh, love to get it for the Haumana. We didn't realize that the um, Hula Hello was part of your student population. Um, but I'd like to know if you plan on having more of these sessions for the nine remaining heroes that you shared with us. And if you're going to continue to have these sessions for the 10 that you listed for right. the future cards. Right. That's a great question. And a lot of Kuliana. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, 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 I'm, I'm, I feel I'm, I'm spit it out, Ron. I'm always doing public talks, so I'll be doing talks on on research all, all the time moving forward. I don't know if specifically I'll be doing these folks. I tend to, um, and this is just my own, the way I see it, is that you know I'm I'm one of those people that works on 20 projects at once, right? And and but the ones that get done are the ones that those voices speak to me, right? And and you're you're mm -hmm. working, that, that name keeps coming up in your research and keeps coming up, and it's like obviously I'm supposed to work on this guy or this woman. So when that happens, I work on those folks. And so like, so right now moving in the next few months, I'm working on Timoteo, the Reverend, Reverend Timoteo. Um, but, but yeah, so, you know, if, you know, if these folks come up again, I'll be doing something specific on them. As far as John Henry Wise, I've written on, on him. Um, my, I, I don't know if you've, if you have, have been to, but I have a website called academia.edu. No, uh, I didn't you Google, know about that. Yeah. If you Google my name, Ronald Williams Jr., it'll come up. And there's a site called academia.edu and everything I've ever written and published is up there. Um, okay. It's welcome for people to, to, to look at. Um, but yeah, I, I, there's, man, I would love for, for, for other folks to jump in too and tell stories. Um, but, but yeah, so that's maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Hope that Just a little plug, a yeah. little push, a <laughs> little motivation. <laughs> well, um, make sure, well, and I gotta get my book finished. My book's due in March, so. But um, okay. uh, do hit me up for the cards, though. I'd love to send some cards out to you. Great. Thanks. Mahalo again. Aloha. Mahalo, Nui. Any other questions? Mana'o. Thank you guys for coming, really. Yeah. Spread the word about Navahi. His birthday is on Tuesday, right? The Tuesday or Wednesday? Tuesday. My yes. <laughs> And just, just want to say I'm proud of you, Ron. Oh, who's uh, that? Oh, my sister. <laughs> your sister. <laughs> Thank you, sis. Your sister. <clears throat> proud of you. Even though I gave out the wrong password. Yeah. Okay. But you fixed it. Yeah, we'll see. I hope I hope nobody missed it because of that. Yeah. Oh, well, mahalo. I just want to say, uh, <laughs> mahalo, Lord from Portland, Oregon. I truly appreciate it. I learned a lot. And I hope to meet you someday when I come home. Hi. Appreciate it. I'd love to meet you. Aloha. 
Mahalo. Mahalo for spending your Saturday afternoon with us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a patriot, yeah? Amazing. You know, what, a, what a patriot. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. there's no more questions. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a beautiful, beautiful weekend. And celebrate Navahi on the 13th. Okay. Aloha. 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 Aloha.